So for our next presentation, a, a, a brief introduction, say, better information leads to better city policy. Unfortunately, many of the world cities still lack basic information on their own transport systems, leading to decisions me measured against anecdotes rather than data. Using new tools for data processing and display, OpenStreetMap can provide information that government needs to make better decisions. In this section, the speakers will share their recent success stories, adopting OSM-based metrics to plan better transport, and also review new tools that the government, mappers, and advocates can use, and will also discuss the challenges that remain and the roles that the OSM community can play in overcoming them. Without much ado, I'll welcome our speakers, Taylor, Walter, and Agar Ali. Thank you very much. Over to you. Well, thank you uh, to everyone for being here today. And thank you to our hosts at OpenStreetMap uh, local associations, especially here in Kenya. Um, my name is Taylor Reich. I represent ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, as well as the Mobility Data Organization, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. And we have Agra Ali from the World Resources Institute and Walter Mayeku from uh, OpenStreetMap Kenya and Trufi. Yes? Um, so I will, yeah, stay up here. Yeah, yeah, please sit down. Um, I will talk for a little while um, first, and I will sort of introduce the broader topic and talk a little bit about uh, footpaths and bicycle lanes and some other things. And then I'll pass it to Walter to talk about public transport in particular and Agra to bring it all together and talk about the entire system um, as well as points of interest, right? Um, so, okay, let me, how do I full screen or presentation mode? Um, yes, okay, very good. Um, so, we're putting sustainable transportation on the map. So first, I'll just introduce very quickly um, ITDP, the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy. We're, oh yes, thanks. Um, we're an international non-governmental organization focused on inclusive and sustainable urban transportation, especially in lower and middle income countries. What I like to say is that, so we help countries avoid making the same mistakes the United States did and invest in buses and metro and bicycle instead of a bunch of big highways everywhere. Um, and most of our staff are in, uh, yes, so people online can hear me now? Very good. So most of our staff are in local regional offices, including here in Kenya, as well as Mexico, Brazil, several other countries. Uh, but I'm from the Global Research Office based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I also represent Mobility Data, the organization responsible for maintaining the GTFS, General Transit Feed Specification, uh, which Walter will be talking about in a little bit more detail. Um, so I have a few topics for us today. The first is why measure sustainable transport? Why is that important? The second is, what has OpenStreetMap data already done around the world? What are the successes that we've seen? I'll touch briefly on the Atlas of Sustainable City Transport, a new product from ITDP. And then I'll get to what I think you're all most interested in, which is the role of OpenStreetMap in making better transportation around the world. But first, I've got to cover the first three. So sustainable transportation is necessary. Uh, research, both from ITDP, the University of California, many other institutions, has found that in order to prevent the worst effects of global warming and stay beneath one and a half or even two degrees Celsius, we need both electric vehicles and also more sustainable cities. Cities where people can live without a car and get everywhere they need to go by walking, bicycling, or riding public transport. So electrification alone won't solve all our problems. We also need better cities. We need cities where you can live without a car. 
And so what has OpenStreetMap data already done to help us get cities where everyone can live without a car? Well, it's done a lot for public transport in India, just for an example. In the city of Pune, in the sort of northwestern part of India, um, uh, the ITDP regional office there found that only about two-thirds of the population live with a neighborhood that has good access to public transport. So you can see on this map, they did the analysis, the purple areas are areas where people can walk to public transport, and the, the red areas are areas of high population density but without good public transport. And so how, what did this analysis result in? It got a lot of attention and a lot of commitments from the government to buy more buses, run more frequent buses, operate more reliable public transport in Pune. And we're already seeing progress. Pune and the Pimpri Chinchwad Authority devote half of their transportation budget to walking, cycling, and public transport. That's probably more than just about any other city around. Um, what about uh, halfway across the world, Brazil? So in Brazil, it used to be the case that every city had a totally different way of mapping bicycle lanes, but OpenStreetMap brought it all together. And so with OpenStreetMap, you can assess all these different cities across Brazil and compare them very clearly to see which cities are leading in bicycle lanes. Uh, and that let us measure the percentage of people who live near a good bicycle lane, which in turn led to government commitments to build more bicycle lanes and bring more of Brazil's population within short 300 meter distance of a good quality bicycle lane. So these are real commitments from not just individual cities like Belo Horizonte and Rio de Janeiro, but also from the Brazilian federal government to, to measure people near bike lanes and increase that number. So by using OpenStreetMap data to measure these indicators, we're resulting in real change from the governments that, that benefits people's lives and make it easier for them to get around their city sustainably and economically. So that's India and Brazil. What about the rest of the world? Well, we've built this tool, uh, the Atlas of Sustainable City Transport. If you have your laptop, you can just go to atlas.itdp.org. And this measures all of those indicators and more for the rest of the globe. But, of course, it relies on OpenStreetMap. The entire thing, all 40,000 jurisdictions that we include in the Atlas, powered by OpenStreetMap. And so we're relying on the OpenStreetMap community to bring together good data that we can then use to convince governments to make more sustainable cities. Just a few more examples of what the Atlas can do. Here we see the city of Santiago de Chile broken out by its uh, sort of neighborhoods or districts and the number of people near protected bicycle lanes in each one. We also have the city of Seattle in the USA, where the government has committed to increasing the number of people within short distance of frequent public transport, buses that come every 10 minutes or better, topic you're going to be talking about. And Seattle, actually, because of this, is the only city in the US where bus ridership has increased in the last five years. Everywhere else, bus ridership is going down. This wasn't an effort of ITDP alone. I do want to give credit to the, the many other organizations we collaborated with. And now I can get to the good stuff, the, the role of OpenStreetMap and the ways that we can work with make OpenStreetMap data better and get to even more impact around the world. So I'm going to start with footpath data. There's two issues I want to talk about with footpath data. The first is the tagging schema, and the second is data availability and completeness. So the tagging scheme. So the current tagging schema, you've got two options. Is there a sidewalk or is there not a sidewalk? Those are your only options. And then you can maybe say the sidewalk surface material or the width, but there's not a lot of other tags you can use to describe the quality. So how would you tag these six different examples of sidewalks that I saw just in Nairobi in the past few days? Some of them are better sidewalks, some of them are worse. Some of them are places where maybe there's not a sidewalk, but there's a little paved area that people can walk on and people do walk on. And, and some of them are just horrible. Um, and so I think there's a clear need for more nuance in order to be able to describe this variety of qualities. Sidewalks are not yes or no. Sidewalks are many different things in between, and we need to be able to describe that detail. 
Fortunately, there are some proposals. There's the Open Sidewalks Project out of actually the University of Washington in the United States. Um, but it has been applied in a few cities in Latin America as well that provides a lot of opportunity for detail. Um, all of these specifics of are there curb cuts, how wide is it, what's the maximum clear path. Uh, you know, I can't talk too much about this in detail, but there's so many resources online. And if you're interested in the sidewalks tagging scheme in particular, let's talk afterward. Um, here's just another explanation of how it works. And you can go to this URL, although it's, uh, it's tcat.cs.washington.edu slash open sidewalks with the S. Um, and learn more about this schema and how it works. But it's, it's not just about having the tagging schema, right? It's also about actually getting the data into the map. So what does the data look like right now? What's the current state of affairs? It's not great. This is the map of Nairobi, and I can tell you for sure that there are many streets that are not on this map that do, in fact, have good quality footpaths in Nairobi, and they're not mapped at all. And there are plenty more that have you know, some footpaths or some sidewalks, some medium quality, and they're definitely not mapped. So almost all of Nairobi is missing in terms of the sidewalk tagging. Um, but of course, there's, I couldn't tell you how many. Around the world. But I can tell you that it would be impossibly expensive if we wanted to hire people to map all of them, or if we even wanted to send out volunteers. We, we just don't have that many volunteers. So we need ways of getting this data without needing to have people going and collecting it themselves inch by inch, kilometer by kilometer around the city. We need more advanced tools. Um, so we need computer vision, really. Um, and there are a couple of really exciting projects around the world using computer vision to identify sidewalks. There are generally two approaches. The first is aerial imagery or satellite imagery. And the second is street view level imagery. I have some slides showing examples, but I can get back to that later if you're interested during the questions. But you know, I think these are really exciting. And I think that the OSM community has a big role to play both in supporting these projects and moving them forward, and then also in facilitating the import of this computer vision data into the map. You know, I know that there's sometimes some friction in the OSM community between manual mapping and automated mapping, and I think from a practical perspective, if we're trying to make a better world, we need both, and we need manual review of automated data. Um, let me just see what I was going to say. And again, I've got some, some cool pictures of computer vision that I can come back to later. Uh, the second thing is cycleway tagging. And this is very much the same situation as footpaths in that currently the tagging schema for cycle lanes is, is very simple. It's basically, is there a bicycle lane? Is there a bicycle track? Or is there nothing? And of course, the world of bicycle infrastructure is so much more diverse than that. And there's so many different kinds of bicycle lanes. Um, oh, my slides are back. Great. So you can see there's like 20 different. So OK, so this is a proposal. It is on the OSM wiki for cycle lane separation is the name of the tag. It's currently a proposal, but it's been used in practice for a couple of years now, everywhere from Berlin, Germany to Medellin, Colombia. I've seen some tags in East Asia coming up. I've, people are adopting it. And it, on the wiki, it even shows status de facto. So it is really a de facto tag at this point that people are using. Um, and so I would really like to you know, try to encourage more use of this cycle lane separation tag. And so me, I'm not an OpenStreetMap expert. You know, I, I like to come to these conferences and learn a lot of things, and I have a lot to learn. But I don't know very much about the process for moving this forward and getting it adopted as an official tag. And so if anyone's interested in that and would like to help push this forward into full adopted tag status, oh, let's talk. Um, but hopefully this slide can illustrate the importance of more nuance in bicycle lane tagging. And of course, there's also a need for more data, not just more tagging, uh, much like with footpaths. And here you can see the mapillary with Meta, one of the 
uh, sponsors of the state of the map has really done a lot to gather a lot of street view data, even mounting cameras on bicycles and tagging bicycle infrastructure from there. Um, one last little point I'd like to, to leave off with is the point of interest data. Um, I think that Agra will be talking more about this, but I'm, I'm very excited about overture maps, but I'm also very excited about increasing point of interest data within OpenStreetMap as uh, at the base, um, and especially including all forms of economic activity, including, you know, hawkers on the street, even little chapati kiosks, um, all forms of economic activity need to have a place because if we don't include informal or lower income economic activity in OpenStreetMap, then that activity is invisible to the city planners. And so if we're trying to argue to the city government, you need to make a bus lane to take people to where the jobs are but all we have is data about the jobs at banks, then the government will make bus lanes to take people to the banks, but they won't make buses to take people to where they actually work in the informal economy. Um, I think that's it for me. I'm gonna hand it over to, to Walter for now. And that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Very good. Uh, and then we'll come back for questions and answers at the end. So thank you all very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Taylor, uh, again. Uh, so I um, want to make this more fun. Uh, I know most of us have, uh, we've been hearing about transport data and probably uh, you have a question like, how do you get the data, you know, how do you integrate all the, the, the different attribute of transport data? Let's say you are having a road, which is X, Y, basically. Uh, a relationship between points. Now we want to make it a route, right? So how do you store routes? How do you use routes? How do you work with the routes? And that is what I'm going to talk about today. And anyone, most of us who've, uh, who are JS experts or people who've interacted with the uh, JS softwares, we know things like shapefiles, right? Anyone who knows shapefiles? <laughs> At least I, I hope most of us know something. Uh, there's a data format that can be used by a JS software. So in transport data, we use something called GTFS. Okay, is that making sense? Yes. The way I always like to explain it, if I, if I may, Walter, yes. is you know how when you're listening to music and an MP3 is the file on your phone for a song? Uh, GTFS is a file type that encodes all of the timetable and route information for public transport. So if you use Google Maps to get directions on your phone, Google has a GTFS file that tells it how to tell you when the bus is coming. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's totally OK. So uh, GTFS is a general transit uh, feed specification, right? And we've already done much of the, of, uh, the what it is. and. I forgot to do a quick introduction that I'm here, courtesy of uh, Trufi. Uh, I volunteer with Trufi, um, and we are working on a few projects uh, to bring uh, public transport, uh, make it better and accessible, safe in our cities. Uh, we have a few working, uh, already public apps uh, working in uh, Cochabamba, we're having in Ghana, we have one in Ethiopia. I think uh, Agro can talk about it. Uh, for a moment when he's doing just to share some light on it. But basically that is what Trophy does. And we are also uh, trying to get Trophy to Nairobi. And that is how now we got to engage with Trophy and see how we can make public transport in Nairobi better. Uh, and essentially, how do you move around creating the GTFS? And I will be using the case study of if you're working with, let's say, uh, that is OSM. Right, so uh, the first thing is you need to collect, uh, basically you need to collect the tracks or rather how we map, we digitize the road data we can, uh, for most of us have used um, public transport apps. I'm going to take an example is from the university way uh, to we have a roundabout that we call Globe or rather let's use the junction to Harituku. So you have one point from the university, of, uh, university way to Harituku, right? Sorry for people online, <laughs> I never get that. But now, 
you want to join this to make a route, now you will have the bus stops, then you have, when you have all this data together, you create what we are calling the routes, or rather, then it's saved in form of the GTFS. Okay, now, when you have all this data integrated together, you can now form a complete route, integrated route for a city, uh, and that is basically how it is. And what we are looking at uh, from Trufi is we want to have this data open, and most of it is open. For an example, I think in Nairobi, we were working with uh, GTFS generated by Digital Matatu back in 2019, and we are in some process of improving the data so that we can use it to have it on, uh, on our Trufi app that will be in Nairobi. And of course, uh, uh, GTFS are pretty much uh, interoperable, uh, interoperable data that it can be used by different softwares as well. Uh, I can load the same GTFS on JOSEM, you can load it on, on, um, on QGIS, on ArcGIS, or any other GIS software. Um, yeah, so basically, if you're narrowing down to how they will look on JOSEM, you can have all your routes split into. Uh, okay, sorry, I think that is not pretty much visible, but you can have your, let's say if I have all the routes in Nairobi, I can have them in my uh, Excel. So I have the routes, the bus stops, all the data that I need related to the route, all the attributes related to the routes. You can isolate the data on uh, JOSEM and you can work on it. We have plugins that can help you edit, look at the errors that come within the bus stops. Do we have any um, breakages in the routes? then you can view this all the data because now all these bus stops and junctions are connected using uh, basically relations. So you can query an entire ID now. It makes that if I'm connecting um, a route from the city center going to my destination where I stay, it's saved as, because it's one route from the destination to where it's from the, uh, the bus stop to the destination, it becomes an entire relation, so it has an ID. So I can query the ID, I can work with it, check out if it's okay. If someone has tampered with it, you can look around, uh, which is not very easy, but of course we need to update that when you're working, let's say you're making the app and you want to make it sustainable, maybe accessibility. Someone has done a change on the route like it happens in uh, when we are having, okay, and a case, case example in Nairobi, when we are having dignitaries using one route, we tend to close another route to use, uh, you know, change a lot of things. You can go to the back end and change the entire thing so that uh, if you are having your app, you can direct people because the entire reason why we are having GTFS or doing things like the Trophy app is to ensure that we have accessibility. Someone can use the route the way you use them to come to the venue, but if the road is crossed, you need to get the update that this route is not functional, right? So that is basically, uh, you have all the details there, you can work on it, you can edit it, and then you have your GTFS, you load it on your, soft, uh, on your application, and then people get access to, uh, to, to safety, uh, public transport, to easy accessible. So basically that will, what GTFS look like, and in the case that of you want to work with OSM, yeah, that is it. Uh, I will want to welcome um, Agro to pr probably proceed and build on more, give us more case studies because I think they've worked on similar cases as well. Welcome. Thanks, Walter. Thanks, Walter. Uh, hi. So I'm Agro and I'm a GIS Research Associate at the World Resources Institute and uh, I am from the Africa Regional Office, based in Addis. So before, like I'll, today, I'll talk about the applications uh, of this GTFS datasets and uh, how we use uh, OpenStreetMap to build solutions uh, in different African cities. Uh, before I go to my presentation, I would like to talk about World Resources Institute. So we are a global data and research organization, and uh, we have been uh, in the research and data sector for the past 40 years, and we are active in more than 76 countries and 400 cities. Uh, so these are the focus cities for um, the African program that we have. We have um, cities program. Uh, it's one of the seven sectors that we work in Africa. 
So we are active in uh, the cities that you see here and uh, the urban mobility team at the WRI Africa. Uh, we work on road safety projects. Uh, we work on a project called Digital Transport for Africa. I'll talk about this later. And uh, we just recently completed a project called 3IM and we have uh, several e-mobility projects in collaboration with uh, different uh, donors and partners. So the Digital Transport for Africa, um, we call it DT4A. It's a consortium of partners that was founded in 2017 by uh, the World Resources Institute, um, you, um, Massachusetts uh, Institute Technology, MIT, Columbia, and the uh, French Development Agency. And we were founded in 2017, and it's a consortium of partners. And we have uh, ITDP, uh, AFD, Digital Matatus as uh, members of uh, this consortium. So what we do is we provide digital solutions to the cities to uh, overcome challenges in their public transport systems. Okay, for that we have uh, different platforms. We have the DT4A website. You can go to uh, digitaltransportforafrica.org on your laptops and check the website and uh, you'll have links to the repositories and resources. So we uh, collect data in a standard GTFS format and make it public uh, and make it available. So with this, I just wanted to bring one example of like how we use GTFS data and open source uh, data to provide solution to the cities. And uh, one of the solutions is the accessibility mapping exercise that we do. We are currently undertaking accessibility mapping for 16 African cities uh, that has uh, GTFS data. Uh, so we are trying to measure access to uh, opportunities and services with public transport in these uh, 16 African cities. And uh, we use uh, GTFS from our Git uh, and POIs from OSM. And we use population data and other input data sets from the World Pop. So I put like one example here from this uh, accessibility mapping exercises. Uh, this is uh, an accessibility mapping that we did for Addis, for Addis Ababa. And as you can see from here, we measured like access uh, to people, access to education facilities, health facilities, recreational ser services, and uh, religion services. And we're doing similar things for the other cities as well. And uh, what makes uh, the Addis case unique is that we have both a formal and informal transport systems in Addis. So we wanted to map the services, the access with uh, formal transport and the informal transport and see if there is any difference between access by the formal and the informal transport. And uh, as you can see from this map, there are like some regions that has more access with informal transport than the formal transport that is provided by the city. And we are offering insights to the city, the transport bureau of the city about these areas uh, where they need to open up new bus routes, formal bus routes, uh, and also increase the frequency of uh, the services. And so, yeah, so we took the POI data from OSM and uh, that's how we build these uh, maps. And w one thing like that I would like to mention about uh, the POIs data from OSM is about its uh, completeness and uh, reliability. And uh, I took this example from Kampala. So these are two different sets of uh, POI data sets. One is taken from the city administration's uh, data set, and the other is from OSM, and you can see there is like some differences between the two. And this brings a question of reali reliability of the OSM data. So in terms of the coverage of the POI datasets. 
So we, we believe that the city provides the right uh, POI data if it has one. And you can like see the comparison. And this brings difference on the accessibility maps. So the one, the accessibility mapping that you see on the left side is uh, the one that we did POI data from KCCA, from the city. And the other one is the accessibility map that we did with POIs from OSN. And I think the difference is clear. You can see like, that the mapping dif te technique is different, but you still can see that uh, the, the accessibility maps came out to be different. So this brings some of the challenge that I usually see when using POI datasets from OSM. The, the first one is uh, incompleteness. Like sometimes the data is incomplete. It doesn't capture all the points of interest in the city. And as Taylor was mentioning earlier, it's really hard to get uh, those small businesses and how they are distributed in the city. So it would be quite helpful if we have uh, those uh, information, those points of interest, so that we can do like more on the accessibility mapping exercise. And the other is the variations in quality. So as I told you, we're doing this accessibility mapping for 16 African cities. So we are like all over the region, all over the continent. And what we see is there is no like quite some common sort of standard. Uh, and for areas that are, that has like fewer contributors, it's really hard to get like complete data uh, about these POIs. And uh, this makes it really hard to do some sort of comparative analysis and uh, research across the different uh, parts of the region. So like, I think uh, it's time to discuss about like, how can we reach to more cities and, you know, capture more uh, points of data uh, yeah, so. yeah, so let's see if this video play. These are like, this is another work that we do. Um, um, the video is not playing. It must be the internet. Yeah. So this is like another example of a project that we uh, do at the at the office. We, as I mentioned earlier, we do road safety projects, uh, and uh, we support the the works with uh, open data. Uh, so we use uh, Mapillary as a main source of uh, this open data for so road safety works. So this is uh, a road safety mapping that we did for Accra. Uh, and we identified some of the spots and uh, we just uh, don't need to go to the city directly. We, we can simply use mapillary and see the characteristics of those areas and why there are like uh, accidents in these uh, given spots and see even the traffic data and everything, all those details. So these are uh, some of the applications uh, where we use uh, open data and uh, that's it. Thank you very much. So let's see if there are like any questions. Thank you. So we have some minutes for questions yeah. mm. because we started yes. a little late. Anyone yeah, so maybe we go for 20 minutes or so Anyone? if yeah. we have enough questions. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you. Um, I think there are some few questions on the online platform. So please, yeah, we will read it out to you. And please, if you have any question, there's a mic, kindly raise your hand and we'll bring it to you and you ask it. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning. Uh, my name is Justin. There is a question here. Do you do any quality or updateness check for the IT DP Atras? Yes. So, will I be audible with this? Very good. Um, yes. So, especially when we are looking at bicycle lane data. We work with, so the question was um, about 
quality checks or completeness checks. Um, so we will, there's a thousand urban areas, 40,000 jurisdictions in the Atlas. We can't check everyone. We have to rely on trusting OpenStreetMap to an extent. Um, but we do work with a few dozen cities where ITDP has close relationships, and we ask them to check, especially the bicycle lane data, but also some of the other indicators. Um, and, you know, of course, we know that data quality varies. As Zygra pointed out, there's a lot of academic research showing this, but especially with bicycle lanes, we do our best to get city experts looking at it. And in fact, in some cities like uh, Guadalajara in Mexico, we've gotten city governments to help do the mapping themselves. So that's the best. I guess that question is kind of just for me, for ITDP, yeah. Uh, I have another question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great how, how ITDP ITDP are using OSM data to advocate for more urban planning question is, what action is ITDP advocating for supporting, training, engaging communities, especially that ITDP has hubs in some global South countries? So the, the question is, what are we doing to support engagement? Yeah. Capacity building? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think WRI can also answer this too, maybe. But we're, um, you know, we, we always push for community engagement when cities are working on local product projects. For example, um, you know, here in Nairobi, our local office is, is working on street designs for some major roads. And one of the things we do is we try to make sure that the government is reaching out to the local community and getting their input in decisions about road design. Um, we will also try, some, some of our offices will also try to build communities in a more almost activist way with events like Open Streets Days. Our office in India will sometimes uh, work with the government to close down streets for people to walk around during the day. Um, and for example, our, our team in Indonesia will often host bicycle rides where they bring together people from the community as well as from the government to ride bicycles together and build connections. Is there anything you'd like to add about how WRI does this? Uh, I think WRI is people, but uh, mm -hmm. let me speak about DT4A, what we do when we go to a city. So the moment we go to a city, we try to connect with different stakeholders at the city level. Uh, we start with the city administration and then go to the universities, academic institutions, uh, try to bring uh, the private uh, organizations, startups, tech startups together and build some sort of mapping community just to collect data and um, uh, you know, have an idea about their uh, public transport system, and uh, we try to build their capacity in, all, uh, especially regarding the tools and um, resources that that we have that we can provide, and how they can update uh, their uh, transit data and uh, map if they don't have uh, any uh, transit data yet. So, we basically work with the whole try to engage with the ecosystem and uh, build that connection with the stakeholders, yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there someone who has a question? I can't ask. And if you have a question, please also say your name and if you're with an organization, which organization it is. Okay, thank you very much for the great opportunity. My name is Omar Katongole. I'm from GeoEth Mapas from Uganda at Macquarie University. Um, my question is simple. Uh, according to the project uh, IDTB you did in Mexico, as well as your application, I'm currently working on a project whereby uh, I'm looking at waste management and waste management transportation, basically using GIS and remote sensing. Um, I'd like to inquire, here in Africa, you look at that some roads are known to standard and uh, what you would call a, uh, a bicycle lane, cars use it, as well as motorcycles use it, and also people walk from there. 
So it's really hard to differentiate what's the use case. So in line with this, how do you address it as IDGP? Would one of you like to answer first, or I can go ahead? OK. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Um, so I think that, I, I do think that this is a real challenge that we have. Um, the idea that maybe something is labeled a bicycle lane and mapped as a bicycle lane, but that's not how people are using it. Um, I think we need to change how we're mapping in that case and how we're interpreting the map data. Uh, I think that there's, and I, I don't have an easy answer to this. Um, I think it may require some rethinking of tagging schemas as well as data collection techniques to make them more appropriate to a, you know, I think a lot of these tagging schemes were developed in places like Germany or the US, which are very rigorous and very specific about how space is used, which can cause a lot of problems, by the way, in how people use the city when things are overly organized. But the tagging schemes are definitely not designed for contexts like uh, Nairobi, where it's a little bit more flexible. And so maybe we need more flexible tagging schemes. Um, but I think that a strength of OSM really is how it describes the physical space rather than how people are supposed to use it. It's a guiding principle that I much respect. And so I think there's a lot of room for us to do things like using computer vision to describe how wide is the road? You know, What are the markings on the road? What is the road surface condition like in different places? When does it turn into dirt or pavers or wood even or whatever? Um, and then from there, we can interpret how people might use it. Uh, we can talk more after. Other questions? Yes. Is it? Oh, it's on. OK. Hi, my name is Julian. I'm with the Heidelberg Institute for Geoinformation Technologies. I am the product owner of the smart mobility team. And one of the software that we develop is the open route service. In the coming months, we will be more and more developing into intermodal and public transit routing and accessibility software. And uh, one plan of us is to provide a, provide a public API for reachability and routing um, that is available for everyone. Um, one thing we, we face a lot of difficulties is accessing data besides the one in the Western Hemisphere. I think it, we can access them quite well, but the areas where you're working in, it's, it's very hard to access the data. And is there a streamlined way, a nice way to access what you are acquiring? And the other question is, are you open for partnerships, maybe? Well, thank you, Julian, but I'll yeah. let... Maybe I'll let me go back to the slide where we have uh, this one. Maybe you can just quickly scan these QR codes so that you can have like access to the data set especially the GitLab site, the Git, on that far side. So you can access, um, we have uh, GTFS data for 20, 22 cities so far. Uh, so one city might have uh, multiple GTFS data sets, so we have uh, lots of them. So it's free to use, you can use it, you can put it in, in any application, any analysis, we're okay with that, as long as you give us the credit. Okay. <laughs> okay. And also for partnerships, maybe we can have like a separate discussion if you would like. Yeah, we are we are happy after this. Cool. Taylor. Yeah. I would uh, just putting my mobility data organization hat on, Julian. I would like to suggest that you look into the mobility database. If you just Google that, that'll get you. Oh, yeah. um, and that's got G GTFS only GTFS. None of the other things that DT Ferry has, but from around the world. Uh, Mobility database. I think it's I think it's just mobilitydatabase.org, but I can help you find it if you can. Great. Uh, question, um, Sam from Hot. Uh, I guess question for you, Tyler. Um, is um, path uh, footway cycleway surface type important to you and your and the analysis that you do, uh, making a case and advocating using using the data? Sam, good question. Um, the short answer is that if we had complete surface quality data, surface material data, we would use it, but we don't, and so we don't. But it could be it could be very useful in you know telling government so, especially if it was something like oh this as was asphalt, but now it's full of cracks. Being able to say something like that would be helpful. Hi, I'm Hector. 
uh, from the University of Camerino in Italy. Although this is more, I mean, it's not part of my research, but I'm uh, really into it personally of public transport and urban planning. Um, wondering uh, how do you really map this informal transportation? I'm thinking, for example, vans that maybe do not have a specific place where to stop on the road, but stop all along a road, and maybe do not have timetables. How do you map it in OSM? And how do you translate it to TTFS? And then later from that data, how can you do the accessibility analysis? Uh, because I'm thinking there should be a lot of challenges with that. Thank you. Just, yeah, maybe this one. Um, Quickly, also to respond to our brother from Uganda, the same, almost similar question, in line of the same. The formality of, of the GTFSs. Number one, uh, from the point of trophy, we believe in doing a community-centered approach. So if I decided to, using the case study of Nairobi, if I decided to use the official bus stops, they are not technically used officially by the buses, right? So if I decided to design my GTFS using the official bus stops, you're not going to have a very usable data, right? So looking at our target is we want to improve accessibility. We want to improve the mobility of Nairobi. So we map what is used by the community, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be accepted by the government. But of course, you can always work with the government, to tell them, because it's part of research, it's part of finding a solution. We need to map digitize all this. And just on the question of like mapping GTFS on uh, OSM, number one, uh, when you query on OSM right now, if you go to OSM, you'll only get the route that goes to different places. That is, we develop GTFSs from the highway that we map, basically. So we want to create routes on it. So we are going to, to have our points, which are now the bus stops, added on it. When you're going to to, to, if you open OSM and just visualize the basic data, you might not necessarily see all the bus stops, all the other data, but now when you're creating the GTFS, it gives you space to uh, now overlay all these other uh, transport attributes on it, and now it can be only accessed from the uh, relationship ID and not necessarily from the first interface when you check OSM. So it's not very easy for you to go and check change the route because number one, if I'm, let's say I'm the first case study, I say that the route has been closed. So are you going to change the road on OSM? Definitely not. You're going to change the route. So the road will remain because the road is always there, right? But we're going to change the route. I don't know if it makes sense. Yes. Uh, you Maybe can, just, yeah. Yeah, just to add uh, with a practical example, uh, for example, we did uh, data collection and mapping, and we tried to compile GTFS datasets for Alexandria, Egypt, Lusaka, uh, Khartoum, Abidjan, Addis. So these are the cities where you have uh, these informal transport systems. And one problem with the GTFS data that we had, that GTFS is very rigid, and uh, it was built for the formal public transport systems. It doesn't have like some way to incorporate the informal transport systems previously. Uh, so in this case, what we did was we did like continuous mapping on the routes and try to get like those stop points, for example, for a continuous dropping off and uh, pick up points. So we map one route continuously and we gather clouds of points and then identify those clouds and just you know put a point representing all those clouds so that's how we did the mapping the gtfs mapping but uh, currently thanks to mobility data we have gtfs flex now so gtfs flex is um, a very good uh, standard that can ca capture this continuous pickup and drop off so maybe taylor can speak more about GTFS Flex? I think you, you explained it pretty well. It's a, an extension to the GTFS format that permits you to designate routes as having continuous uh, pickup drop off or as serving a flexible geospatial area, right? A polygon rather than just a line. Um, I think uh, in, in practice, a lot of the data collection often looks like you know, having volunteers, students, or paying people to just ride buses with an app 
and track the routes that way. Um, but we have been advocating for governments to get more involved in using GTFS as part of regulation and formalization of informal transport. Another question? Oh, yeah, Alex. Oh, perfect. Yeah, please. Oh, he's an expert. So you ride on board uh, as a data collector. Make sure that you simply pick all the points or the uh, stops that are called by the passengers. And after one month, uh, one month long data collection process, you realize a cluster for uh, popular calls. Uh, some few points may be left in between. So you may not want to bother your head with those ones, they become like the outliers. But basically, you will simply realize clusters that are within a range of maybe uh, 50 meters. And then you realize that this, and strangely, they all have uh, the same name that are attributed to those stops. So you realize that those are the community uh, stops that everybody recognizes. So once the names are consistent for uh, the, uh, let me say the predominant number of stops, you, you recognize it unofficially. But eventually, uh, the city of Accra has adopted those stops, and we advocate infrastructure to be placed uh, for public transport purposes. So then it becomes part of your GTFS uh, data. So I think the underlying principle is just to make sure that you get a coordinate that can make reference to clusters that you pick, uh, let me say, a centroid to represent uh, uh, the collection. Thank you. OK. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Tabushun Sharif Nigo. I am from OSM Uganda. So basically, I have two questions, but one of them has been answered already, especially when you talked about collaborations, because I have seen my city, when you are displaying digital transport information for KCCA, KCCA is our city there. So now about the collaboration, yeah, you said you're open for collaborations. Thank you so much. I'll reach out to you after here. Then the other thing I wanted to know is perhaps where exactly can we find your offices in our city such that we can reach up? out to you people because like me personally yeah i did some research that was about access to transport system also meaning that during my research it was about providing access to these buses dropping children to schools eh? there's way they always de delay a lot why access and the, it, their delayment was basically because of the road system as well and the time taken they take from one home to the to drop a student in fact, a pupil, yeah, those nursery kids, they take longer. Meaning that, why I'm saying this is, I wanted at least if you can tell me your office, I go there because I feel like I also have some idea which can be an input to the current system you're having there. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think we don't have an office there, but we have people. Esther, do we have an office in Kampala? Just a representatives, right? Emma, yeah. Maybe we can connect you with someone uh, who works for WRI uh, that sits in uh, at Kampala City. But we don't have like an office space there. Yeah. Uh, I have a last question. My last question is how much variation is there in the definition of points of interest? Example, between government definition and OSM definition? <laughs> you were talking about the schools. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the government, I'm, I'm not sure if I get the question though. 
I guess in terms of like the, the definition, is it the question is sort of about the definition or categorization of facilities and points of interest, is that right? The question, how much variation is there? Validation? Vari variation. 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 Uh, uh. Yeah, variation is there in the definition of points of, of interest. Example, between government definition and OSM definition. Uh, I don't know how we can measure that, but uh, we haven't done any measurement on the differences between the two data sets. So I just put that as an example, uh, but like there are like some uh, differences on the geographic distribution and then the attribution itself as well. Uh, so the data set from the city tells, uh, uh, it captures most of the academic institutions, for example, that are run by the private uh, owners and then the government owners, including the universities and all those uh, uh, facilities. And we, we, we also have the same uh, attributes in uh, OSM as well. Uh, you can identify the universities and other schools. Uh, so basically it's uh, the same, but uh, it's about like the number of uh, facilities that are captured by the OSM uh, POI points. I, I think I... Yeah. Um, so, uh, and maybe just on the same, uh, let me use uh, an example of, uh, we were working on a project where we are having school data by the Minister of Education in Kenya. And what they're only having is they are only giving us the name then the level, which is primary, secondary, right? That is as we use it. But on, on OSM, our level is ISCED, uh, right? So you have level one, two, three. So there is always a workflow, but of course it takes time. If you're having such different data sets, you can uh, overlay both of them through maybe a training session and you try to you know, work on those uh, individual columns. Maybe you're working with a spreadsheet, then you find a way how you can merge the data uh, so that you have them. Now, it's all dependent on your use case. If you want to work with OSM data, you switch it to OSM tags because we don't do that. We are only going to meet with errors, right? So you always try to find that, but definitely, uh, I think there is a big distinction, no, not so big, uh, but the government data, of course, a good example is roads in Kenya, highway data. We don't have primary roads, we don't have secondary roads, we don't have you know, residentials. But there is always a way of, if you want to integrate this, you, have, you, know, you need to have a session work with whoever collected the, uh, let's say government data, like the tagging scheme of the government, you integrate it, like you look at the OSM data schema, then you find a way of how uh, they are looking. Then we have, of course, you will always get a lot of inconsistencies where you might end up probably not working with all the available data sets, right? So you always find a way of trying to do that, but definitely it's, you don't have, it's, it's not much that you have to merge the government and OSM data because uh, uh, OSM is a global entity, <laughs> right? Of course, it was uh, initially designed, and we have a, a tagging schema that we work with, and of course we have new suggestions that we're giving, but we always try to find ways to basically merging synergies between the government and the, uh, and the communities, and we say OSM data is community data. We are trying as much as possible to represent the community and not necessarily as the government defines hospitals, bars, and uh, the rest of them. Uh, I hope we are trying to answer the entire question because it came in. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank very... you so much. There's one more note I'd like to add on the question of points of interest. Um, which is only very slightly related, but I wanted to address something that the previous presenters from Nepal raised, which is the issue of gender in OpenStreetMap data uh, and the way that I think a lot of sort of traditionally male serving locations are more represented than traditionally female or women serving uh, locations. And, you know, one of the things we would like very much to do at ITDP is map people's ability to reach childcare locations. And that is just so poorly mapped in OpenStreetMap right now. And I think that that's, an, that's a big issue around the world, in the US as in um, Kenya as in Latin America. Um, and so thank you for bringing that up. And 
I, I just wanted to maybe even end with that, unless there's some other questions. Um, there are no other questions. And thank you very much for um, paying attention and your patience. Um, from here, we have um, break. Please kindly go and have your lunch. And please, if you have more questions, clarifications, and collaborations, kindly reach out to them whilst we are here in person. And if you're online, kindly reach out to them via their profile on their website. And please, I hope they would be of service to you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you.